Sean Fain likes to call this a defining moment uh, for his union. This is a defining moment for Biden and, mm. uh, and, and what has become known as Bidenomics. He has staked his claim on this idea that we can rebuild domestic capacity, uh, cut carbon emissions, and make them good jobs simultaneously. This is yeah. a prime text case I believe of that in it. proposition. <laughs> I believe that. I, was I mean, I just, you. I yeah. do think that it's like you need, it, it, you have to have people living a life that you can overlord. If you want to continue to be a billionaire <laughs> and a person in power, you you have to have people that you're in power over. They have to be able to exist. They you don't need people. To... You've got ashes. <laughs> have I told you about the ashes <laughs> yet? <laughs> David, I was going to ask you about Bidenomics. Like, you know, Bidenomics gets thrown around as like negative from the right, maybe positive. I don't know if he's going to incorporate that into his campaign run. Uh, if he shirks all these, you're too old accusations that are suddenly <laughs> flying, coming out the woodwork. Yeah. Um, but yeah, how do you characterize Bidenomics? I guess you just said it, but do you feel like it is tenable at this moment? in our in sort of the american economy being what it is and like climate being what it is and income inequality being what it is is this kind of kind of a pipe dream to sort of thread the needle and have these sort of reforms i don't know that's just my sense is like i mean i i think there's no reason that we can't do it um mm. that there's enough uh certainly uh loads of money in terms of these subsidies what we've seen in the last year is manufacturing construction and that's really what the stage we're at it takes some time to build these factories but manufacturing construction has gone up fourfold since the investments announced in the Inflation Reduction Act and the CHIPS bill. Um, we, we've, we've, we've definitely seen uh, private sector commitments. So like money not being laid out by the government, but the private sector has committed hundreds of billions of dollars to this transition. So I, I think there is a sense that we are moving on this. The mm -hmm. question is, who's going to benefit? Is it just going to be these companies uh, their consultants, their executives, uh, their investors, or are workers going to get a piece of this transition? That is sort of the the threshold question. The other le the other side to this, and another side to Bidenomics, is uh, the the fight against concentrated corporate power. We're seeing that at the level. You know, this week is the second week of the U.S. versus Google trial, where Google is being sued by the U.S. government. Uh, because it is a monopoly and it, it took basically it paid Apple and uh, your Firefox browser and all these other companies to be the default setting on your. So like if you open no, it, up not Firefox, iPhone, don't taint that. Yes, they, I <laughs> got to take that away from you. I'm sorry. Um, uh, they, if you see that pop up on your phone or on your browser. Bought and sold. That uh, dude, they paid him money to disappear. He was out. He <laughs> like, was out front. hell yeah. He I've been a butler my whole life. But we're talking <laughs> about $20 billion a year Google is paying for that trip. <laughs> And wow. uh, and they're saying, well, we're just the best. And so why did you pay $20 billion to be in that preset section if you're just the best? But the point is that this ref reflects a new aggressiveness on the part of Lena Khan at the Federal mm -hmm. Trade Commission, mm -hmm. on the part of uh, Jonathan Cantor, who's the head of the antitrust division at the Justice Department, which is waging this case against Google, to uh, say that um, and they're 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 using a, a really new conception of uh, antitrust legislation, saying that it's not just about prices, although prices are a big part of it, and we obviously want to make things more affordable. But it's also about how concentration and monopoly affects workers, about mm -hmm. how it affects uh, uh, partners or, or or rivals or entrepreneurs who are trying to innovate. Um, so uh, that's another piece of the puzzle here. I think. And um, uh, so the it's problem a huge is, piece. That is, the, we need to make I them mean, scared, a the little scared. Here's the problem. The problem is, is that you can't talk about the government or the administration as if it's one thing. Mm -hmm. It's, it's a, it's a, a mass of thousands of people, some of which are working at complete cross purposes with one another. And uh, I think that's especially so in this administration where Biden uh, even even years and decades going back is a procrastinator, is not someone who uh, always uh, has like a full agenda laid out and, and just sort of lets people freelance and do their own thing. 
uh, we're seeing that, you know, we, I can name 20 examples of really good things the Biden administration is doing and 20 really bad things. And sometimes right. in the same agency. Right. So uh, there's a, there's not a coherent plan. There's not like a coherent message. And I think one of the reasons I mean, there are many reasons we can talk about them. But one of the reasons why we're seeing so much labor unrest is that the the uh, I mean, at one sense, the, the Biden labor people have facilitated that they've uh, made it easier uh, by an, a ruling just in the last month to, to actually form a union. Uh, they have, uh, you know, provided Seriously. a lot of support to uh, Starbucks and, and, and those campaigns. Um, yeah. But at the same time, uh, uh, workers are taking it into their own hands because there is a, sort of a lack of agency and a lack of leadership on the part of government. And yeah. Uh, yeah. so, you know, there, there have been these uh, various stories about uh, talking to workers at UAW and saying, well, Biden came out and said that the workers deserve their fair share. It wasn't that great. And they said, Democrats haven't done anything for me in 20 years. Uh, yeah. I can't even afford my electric bill. I can't afford my, to buy a house. Right. Uh, you know, I feel like I'm out here alone. And the yeah. only thing I have is the union. And I think that's a sentiment that's broadly shared. Amen. That's huge. I mean, and it reminds me, it's not the same, but we are around the anniversary of, of Occupy Wall Street. It reminds me of the mm -hmm. attitude going into the reelection of Obama. Um, you asked, I remember a lot of media would like ask kids on the street, kids, people <laughs> who were part of this massive movement. <laughs> or kids. But kids. Yeah, I'm sure they had an opinion as well. I mean, they were, yeah, they were, these were young college grads with nothing, with very little and coming out of this, you know, the great recession. And, and they were asked about Obama and they'd be like, I don't know, man. Like it was just a lot of like, like he's over there. It's been four years. We don't see promises. Income inequality is insane. Um, there's no, f we feel like our future. I mean, we just talked about like 4% of <laughs> Gen Z feel like there's hope. <laughs> like, right. there's like, you know, and so it kind of is the same thing. I, it reminds I me, mean, Obama was reelected. I think Biden can do it again in terms of winning. Right. But I don't think you're well, going to see the energy that you did in 2020. There's a sense of catastrophe. I mean, it's like, well, if it's if you would, it's him because if it's not him, we all die. <laughs> you right. Know what I mean? like, resignation to it. Yeah, but the, but I mean, I th I think if you're if you're asking about you know, well, why is there this sort of upset? Why is there this anger? Why is there this uh, disappointment? Uh, there's two things I think we have to think about. First is that. Uh, we have seen a reduction in inflation. However, that just means that it's, it's a reduction in the rate of acceleration of rising prices. It doesn't mean that the increase in those prices went away. And uh, the, the, the fact that the way the media presents it as, oh, it was 5.2 and now it's 4.8, it just means that things were, instead of being going from $16 to $20, they went to 17 yeah. And uh, that's still, you know, difficult for people, particularly in things like housing. Uh, the second thing is that uh, during the pandemic, we created this pop up safety net. You mentioned checks before very briefly. Mm -hmm. uh, we had that. We had boosted unemployment in 2021 during the American Rescue Plan. We had the uh, child tax credit extension, I missed which out came on out it. every month. <laughs> I uh, fucked yeah, up. You did. I, did. I would just so. <laughs> yeah, years, yeah, Aaron, you got it. Ahead. Damn it. <laughs> Double. Yeah. <laughs> um, and then that all went away. And yeah. we actually got yeah. poverty statistics last week. And what they show is they're like a U-shape. So in 2019, they're here. Here we go. And uh, then poverty goes way, way down in, uh, I can't do it because it's the opposite side of me. Um, and then it goes way back up again. Because we kind and, of uh, had universal income for a moment. We had it for a little while. <laughs> yeah. And, uh, and after it, it went away, the poverty statistics went right back to where they were in 2019. And it's almost like, people, I think, would have been less frustrated, people affected by that, would have been less frustrated if nothing happened like that. If it was just even, there was sort of this grindingly slow improvement in poverty statistics. But they saw the better world and then it was ripped away from them. Yeah, right. And the people who saw that better world are disproportionately younger because they have less money. They're disproportionately non-white because they correlate with people in poverty. And they're disproportionately sort of the base of the Democratic Party in many ways. So uh, it's not surprising why even uh, what would be called Biden's own base is frustrated. 
yeah. uh, with this economy. And it's going to take some time for that to be repaired. Absolutely. And then lastly, I think to me, like, and this is always debated in democratic circles. I think some centrist Dems think this is not the case, but you know, the energy of the George Floyd protests and the BLM movement absolutely translated into the election. Nobody was excited about Biden in 2020. And then the fucking police state came out and tried to kill people while they were marching. And everyone was like, oh, okay. Yeah, 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 yeah. And it was and nothing's been done, right? Like nothing on that front um, when it comes to criminal justice reform. Yeah, I said reform, <laughs> you know, like no one's talking about defund, well me, right. you know, and so and so that I think is also, it's gonna be another squeaker, David, I think, was, <laughs> but uh, I appreciate, yes, the remembering the positive, but also remembering, yeah, this is, this is a little bit of a rudderless administration that is drifting towards good things. Um, well, the I other thing is that Biden's so bottled up, they won't let him say two words because they're afraid he's going to say something crazy that uh, they they have hermetically sealed this administration. I read the book, uh, The Last Politician by Franklin Foer, which just came out a couple of weeks ago. Mm -hmm. And it tells the story because it's an inside story. <laughs> and it tells the story of Biden uh, where he is like really energetic in meetings and directing things and coming up with strategies and all this. And it's kind of like the old SNL sketch where Ronald Reagan is a mastermind. Uh, the, uh, in public, they're like, they're holding him like down. Having a uh, uh, Girl Scout cookie events with uh, the, the whoever <laughs> sold the most cookies. And then, uh, you know, when that person leaves the room, he's like back to work. And, uh, you know, he's, 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 he's a masterminding Iran Contra. I, like that was the disconnect that reading huh. this book felt like because they have completely taken Biden out of the public eye. They do not want to expose him to interviews. They don't want to expose him to, uh, you know, uh, any kind of unscripted setting. And I feel like we had four years of Trump where he was all unscripted setting. And, and it, the, it, it was this illusion of activity when he wasn't actually doing anything. But because he was everywhere and talking a lot and tweeting a lot, you thought stuff, stuff was going right. on. And now this is the opposite of that. Right. You, know? you, you think nothing's going on because you I never actually, see the president. I'm realizing that there like, actually is a lot going on. Right. So I'm, I'm realizing that's been psychologically effective for me. I'm like, oh, he's busy. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Right. He's working, and that's why I'm not seeing a bunch of. <laughs> totally. No, I, mean, I think a lot I think, of people I think want to a lot of people it creates this like vacuum. You know. Yes. Mm -hmm. Yeah. We we we're like yeah. I call him a rebound president, um, and he's yeah. just a warm body. But you need him to like you know like. Speak well, he's not up like once Rosa, in a while. And, and being obviously... up for the task of of being president is different than being up for the task of campaigning for president. Those are two different skill sets. And uh, in 2020, he didn't have to do a lot of that campaigning because we were all locked down. Yeah, uh, he was. In, it was like a, a basement campaign. And, uh, you know, this time is going to be different. And we got to see if he's uh, available, able. And so uh, if not, who who can help him? Are they kind of like Munchausen by proxying him? Like, are they like keeping him? <laughs> well, they're like, look at what happened to Mitch McConnell. You don't want to be standing out there and go blank. I think it's they're like worried about that, but I think they're more worried about him just making a gaffe, uh, which yeah. is his entire I think history. It's a reasonable it's, it's, concern. It's, it's not unreasonable, but at some point you got to kind of take the good with the bad. Exactly. You get the you get the fire, and then you get the you know the whatever the like the, the brain yeah, farts. Whatever. Yeah, yeah. But I, I think mean, that's it's the said, price you pay for actually having a present a president who's present. Yeah, exactly. No, it's true. Like every single zinger is also kind of scripted, right? Like we've seen when he do, does speeches, and he's like, "Infrastructure Week." used to be a punchline. Now it's, what is it? What was the, I can't even remember. Now it's like the main line or now whatever. Like it's a headline. Oh, it's a headline. There we go. It used to be a punchline. Now it's a headline. It's like, that's a great line. It was also scripted for you. Just let him, let it, let him roll. Let him do whatever he wants. Let someone Biden said that on Biden. this, sh let Biden be Biden. Someone said that on this show, might, I don't think it was you, but someone else was just like, that was the best part of Biden. Him just kind of like, yeah, dog face pony soldier. Let's go, you know, like <laughs> say whatever you need to say. Well, I and mean, yeah. interestingly, probably one of his high highest moments as president from a rhetorical standpoint is when he baited 
Republicans into having a debate about yes. Social Security during yes. the State of the Union. That wasn't scripted. Yes. And he, he proved to be, you know, he essentially took that off the table. And I yeah. think what happened since that State of the Union? There, there, mm -hmm. there's, he, that was the most populous State of the Union that we've heard it's in right. many, many years yeah. in February. And there's been no results from it. And interestingly, that was the last thing that Ron Klain did before he left as chief of staff. And we have this new guy, uh, Jeffrey Zients, who's like a, he's like a business guy. He's, he's, yeah. he's, uh, so, you know, I think that's a, a part of it, too. He's not being. Uh, not it being was Klain's used. last stand. Yeah. Well, I mean, that's that's sort of sad. It seems like some of the, like the neoliberals are, you know, are the, winning the fight inside like inside the administration, there's clearly push and pull between, you know, these shades of of blue or whatnot. And um, yeah, that doesn't bode well um, for a second term. But we'll see. Um, David, Dan, God, this has been a wonderfully long and beautiful show. We didn't even talk about the shutdown. Do you yeah. want to just tell us what the hell is going to happen? We're going to shut down. I think is what's going to happen. Uh, yeah, get ready for it. October 1st. Don't go to your Woo! local national park. Oh, God damn it. Um, all because Kevin McCarthy is trying to. Um, he's, yeah, he's afraid of his he's afraid of his far right. Uh, he thinks they're going to uh, get rid of him if he partners with Democrats, which is the only way anything's going to get done. And everybody knows it in Washington. But there's these brain worms that hit leadership in Washington where they think that, uh, oh, but if we can just show leverage, if we can just show that 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 we can pass something and they can't. And it's just all nonsense. Like nobody is going to uh, the, the only way that you're going to uh, move this forward is by just saying, OK, we'll fund the government for a few weeks and we'll keep working on it. Uh, that's the only thing that's going to pass that uh, the Freedom Caucus doesn't want that. They want to make cuts immediately. And nobody's going to agree with that in the Senate, which is controlled by Democrats and the White House, which is controlled by Democrats. And they just want to piss on something and make their mark. Exactly. And, and uh, you know, so far, McCarthy hasn't shown himself being willing to break with him. No, he is. He's a doggy pee pad. Um, all right. Well, TBD. <laughs> What's going on, Fran Tifa? If you haven't already, subscribe to this channel right now. Hit that button. And also, you can become a patron and support the show every single week. Get access to bonus episodes and exclusive merchandise. Patreon.com slash Bituation Room. Do it.